Stand it if you would and turn to page 529. <clears throat> there 
shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sin from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys. Sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. <coughs> showers of blessing. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Be seated, Brother Keith. Good morning. I'd like to welcome each one to the Sunday school hour this morning. If you'd like to turn with me this morning to, to Galatians in chapter 6 this morning. Galatians in chapter 6. I'm just going to read just part of actually one verse this morning, share my thought with you this morning. Galatians 6 and verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens. Bear ye one another's burdens. And with that thought in mind... You know, we think about it, you know, you know, we share our prayer requests with, you know, with our brothers and sisters. You know, a lot of folks, you know, just got a lot of burdens. And whether, whether it be physical burdens, spiritual burdens, just are needing help. You know, bear you one another's burdens. You know, all of us need help, needs help at times. We all need help. And with that thought in mind uh, about helping one another, uh, why why is it and I'm sure I'm not the only one is uh, if somebody helps you we automatically feel obligated sure. we automatically feel obligated to do something back for them and that's a good thing it's not that it's, it's not a good thing is but a lot of times we help folks do we help folks to get something back or get help in return or for a certain or do we help folks to help folks you know, we all need help at times. And may the Lord help us to help just to be helping. Uh, you know, if, if we're helping for any other reason, all oh, that's going to go up in smoke someday at the judgment seat. Yes, sir. But may the Lord help us to help folks just to be helpful. But again, uh, something uh, Brother Brady was, uh, was on this week as well, and I'm going to share that with you this morning. Read it. Psalms 121 says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth 
and even forevermore. Well, we all have to agree that our ultimate help comes from the Lord. And when we help those who need help just to be helping, we allow the Lord to use us. But with that being said, back to my original thought, bear you one another's burdens. Do you ever have a time when you get bombarded with things? What we would call bad news or just discouraging news. Just gets to where you're afraid to answer the phone. Like you because you're just getting hit from every side. And this is where I want to leave a thought with you this morning. I know at times we're like that, but I believe our pastor right there, he gets hit with that a lot. All of us, we all have troubles and trials. Who do we call? We call pastor. And that just hit me this as I was going over this this morning. It just hit me. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we have times where we get bombarded. And our pastor gets bombarded quite often. I mean, you know, it just encouraged me more to lift the pastor up in prayer for the Lord to encourage him and to help him. You know, we have times, troubles, you know, and like they, we get calls and I think, you know, and it just hit me. Pastor gets them all the time. He gets them all the time. He gets, he gets hit all the time. And may the Lord help us to hold him up in prayer. May the Lord help us. I have to ask Brother Evan, Brother, if you'd like to please Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we sure do love you this morning. <coughs> Thank you, Lord, for the place to come and worship you today. And Father, we God pray us. for the devotion that Brother Keith has given us, Father. I pray that you would help us in this area. Lord, I pray that we would help others, Lord, not to get help, but be helpful to them. Father, I pray for the service today that you would move on this place and touch it in a great and mighty way. I pray for the Sunday school teachers that you would help them and bring back to the remembrance what they have studied. Father, be careful to thank you for everything that's done because your word. Thank you for being good to us. Jesus, Amen. Christ has taken the Thank you, Brother Keith. Appreciate the devotion this morning and appreciate the uh, kind words and encouragement about praying uh, for me. And I certainly need your prayers. And I uh, thank the Lord for his blessings to be back in our Sunday school class today and to see you all here. And I've been excited about getting back in the house of the Lord and seeing everybody and meeting together and hearing from God's word and fellowshipping around the goodness of the Lord. So. Uh, thank the Lord to be here today. We've got, uh, we want to go to the Lord in prayer before we uh, begin our uh, Sunday school time. And I've got several prayer requests here I want to share with you this morning on our list. Uh, Brother Randall is preaching at Meadowview for Brother Ralph today. He'll be uh, with them all day. Matter of fact, I think he told me he's preaching three times. They got a nursing home service. He'll be preaching as well. So remember Brother Randall. And then Brother Sam, Loy is preaching today, I think uh, in Lenore City, I believe. And uh, remember Brother Sam and pray for him and Miss Trish. We certainly miss uh, all three of these being uh, gone from us today, but thankful the Lord is using them. And continue to remember Brother Don Tilson's brother Ray and uh, Miss Gail Hamby, Brother Billy Mitchell, um, somebody, Brother Alan Johnson went to visit him this past week. And um, uh, he said that, uh, he's, you know, he's doing pretty good, but just really weak. Uh, Brother Randall and Miss Dean Hahn, please pray for them. I talk, spoke with Miss Dean yesterday, and Brother Randall has been on some experimental med medicine for several years now that has kind of retarded the growth of this cancer, and he's done well. But that medicine has now quit working. His, I don't know if his body rejected it, how exactly how that works. So the cancer is spread. It's spread into his hips, and, and he's experiencing a lot of pain. And the doctors are going to put him on another experimental medicine. So she asked particularly that we would pray that that medicine would help. So please remember Brother Randall. And Miss Dean is not doing very well. She, of course, fell and broke her leg back some time back. And uh, she's unable to walk without the assistance of a walker. 
So they just uh, continue to have a lot of uh, medical needs. So remember the Hans and uh, Miss Roxy. Remember Wesley Melhorn and Josie and Bailey, uh, Brother Bailey, Miss Wanda Young, uh, Conley and Helen Hamby. Uh, let's continue to pray Miss Teresa about a couple special situations. Uh, Miss Wanda Landrum, um, Pastor Lee Davis, Melissa Earwood. She went back into hospital this week with her can battle with cancer. She's been very ill. Remember her. And then Miss Carolyn Wells, Brother Larry's wife. I spoke to Brother Andy yesterday, checked on her. She is uh, improving slowly, and she hope, hope to get her out of the hospital soon. So remember Miss Wells, pray for her. She's been really, really sick. Um, uh, Miss Heather's friend Katie Shook, who has cancer, remember her. And then now, because um, she's battling cancer and her husband's having to care for her some, he's lost his job. They've had to let him go. They said they used all the family leave they could use, done everything they could, but they just had to let him go. So not only is she facing cancer now, they in a situation with financial um, devastation at the door. So please pray for them and pray that the Lord would open up some opportunity there for them. And then Miss Cheryl Collins' friend, Lois Lane, we've been praying for her, continue to remember her. And then I mentioned about Brother Ralph Nance. Remember him, he's recovering from his heart surgery. And uh, Miss Amy's brother, continue to pray for him. Is he doing okay? Yeah. All right. All right. And then Donnie. All right. Let's continue to remember Donnie and pray for him. And then Miss Janet Cap, she mentioned she went out the other day. She said, I've got seven special requests. I want you to ask the church to remember these seven special requests. So remember the, these burdens that are upon Miss Cap's heart. Uh, Brother Scott Crass has a special request he asked me to mention. Please remember that. Brother Jay's Uncle Richard in the nursing home going to get, get out, hopefully. Uh, did you say Monday? Today. today. Okay. So remember Richard, pray for him. And then Brother Jay's cousin Stanley. He's been had uh, a lot of health problems. And remember, pray for Stanley, please. Somebody else this morning with a prayer request before we pray? I saw where the, uh, that preacher, Brother uh, Rochester's pastor, yeah. he is back in Rockville. They took him back this morning. Is that right? Well, he's, he's got back again. Um, yeah, thank you for reminding me. I don't, I don't know how I didn't get on my list, but Brother Shelton, that's uh, Brother Brady and them's pastor, been in the hospital, and then I text him, I think it was yesterday morning to check on him, and uh, he said that he was still in the hospital. And then a few minutes later, he texted me and said he's going home. So I was very thankful for that. But now, as you heard, he's back in the hospital. So he's been really, really sick. Been in the hospital over a week. And, uh, you know, it's uh, severe sickness this day and time if you're in the hospital over a week. So remember, Brother Shelton, pray for him. Somebody else this morning? All right, let's remember Brother Jay's brother, Steve. Pray for him. He's got a lot going on with his leg, and uh, he needs our prayers. Someone else? She's going to have or did have? Going to have. Okay. All right, let's remember Miss Tanya's mom. She has surgery on Tuesday. Somebody else? All right, let's remember Miss Diane's Aunt Betty's family. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Let's do remember that. Uh, pray about these test results. And in the Weatherfords and Jeff, our nation, let's remember these. Somebody else? Yes, 
All right, let's remember Miss Joni's heart test tomorrow. Uh, Kylie and Dan, um, excuse me, Kylie and Miss Becky are both sick this morning. Remember Miss Becky and Kylie, the other Miss Becky. All right, let's remember Josh's uh, grandfather. Pray for him some health issues. Somebody else? Who was that today? Okay. All right. Let's remember Bradley Rogers with cancer. Somebody else? Brother Don, uh, your brother Ray, is, uh, is has he come home or still in the hospital? Okay. Well, I know they were saying they were going to try to send him home the other day, as bad as he was. All right. Let's continue to pray for Ray. Anybody else prayer request? All right. We'll pray for our Sunday school time. Ask the Lord to help us today. Amen. Brother Kurt Adams, would you lead some prayer, sir, please? Please help us, Father. Just touch these needs this morning. Pray, God, you'll be with us. Amen. Okay, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. If you want to turn your Bibles there this morning. I do appreciate the good meeting we had. Brother Brady did an outstanding job preaching um, this past week. Beginning on the Lord's Day and the singing was great. We really thank the Lord for the meeting. What a blessing it was. Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. I don't think Brother Jay would mind me telling this. I, I asked him, I said, Brother, how's your hip doing? He said, oh, Brother, said, my hip, my knees, I don't know what's going on. I said, I'm fixing to tell you when I get up here and teach out of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 exactly what's going on. And it's not just going on with Brother Jay, it's going on with all of us. And uh, chapter, uh, beginning in chapter 11, verse 7, all the way to chapter 12, verse 8, Solomon records for us the course of life from youth to old age. And uh, he paints a picture for young people here. He's addressing young people, and uh, he, 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 he gives this picture, paints this picture that brings them from the exuberance of youth to the frailty of old age. And his whole purpose in this is encouraging, encouraging them to serve the Lord while they're young. That any life lived outside of honoring the Lord and serving the Lord is vanity. And that youth passes so quickly. And it's given to us not to waste and to squander, but to utilize that strength and that exuberance and, uh, that, that, a, that youth have uh, for, the, for the Lord and for the glory of the Lord. And so in this, in this section, Solomon reminds us of the fleeting and the frail nature of life, how quickly it goes by, and how drastically that our body changes with time. And he, he employs some beautiful imagery and poetic language to paint a verbal picture of the path of life from youth to old age. And so far we've seen two things. Um, he's be appreciative. Chapter 11, verse 7 through 10. And then be attentive. Chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Where it says, remember now thy creator. And it means to deliberately put markers in our life 
so we do not allow ourselves to forget about the one who made us and made everything. Do it now. That's what he says. While you're young, don't wait till you're old and your ability to serve the Lord is hindered by your physical limitations. Do it now. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. And then uh, chapter 12, verse 3 through 6, be aware. Okay, so be appreciative, be attentive, be aware. And in these verses, Solomon takes a poetic look at what's ahead for the young person if they don't die young or if Jesus doesn't come back while they're young. This is what they're going to be facing. He paints a picture of old age. And so let's see how he describes it here. Let's, let's read these verses and then we're going to go through and look at each little phrase uh, one by one. The Bible said, verse 3, In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitchers be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. And so this is, this is po poetry. And I think y'all been, we've been around each other long enough to know where I fall in this poetry stuff. I'm on the low end of the spectrum. Not that I don't like it or don't appreciate it. It's just that I don't understand it most of the time. And uh, so I've had to really do a little digging to try to understand exactly what Solomon is saying here. And so he is giving a description, painting a picture, if you would. Okay, now, usually when I say something, I just say what I say. But people who are poetic, they express what they're feeling. And what they feel about something. They look at something, you know, and uh, I look at uh, whatever. I look at the wall and I say, well, it's uh, wood paneling. But somebody who's poetic, they look at, express how they feel about it, you know. And, and, they, and so there's a detachment there between me and poetry for some reason. But that's what Solomon's doing. It is a painting. It is a painting utilizing words on a canvas of paper. And he describes, he paints a picture of old age. So let's see how he describes it here. The first thing, the first way he describes it is, the keepers of the house shall tremble. So here Solomon speaks about the arms and the legs. Okay, those are the guardians of the house, of the body. They're the ones who protect this body. Somebody comes at you to attack you, first thing you do, you put your hands out to guard your body. Yeah, when danger comes, we, we kick back at the danger. We put our feet up to keep something from getting to our body, put our arms up. And as we age, these keepers of the house, they begin to tremble and they begin to shake. And legs and arms, they don't have the strength that they once had. The muscle tone diminishes. Even the bone strength deteriorates in our arms and our legs. And we begin to notice that we can't do the things that we once did. We just don't have the strength in our arms to pick up what we used to pick up easily, to uh, bend over and stand back up. We slow down. When we bend over, we say, well, while I'm down here, let me think of maybe two or three more things I can do while I'm here, you know, because I don't want to have to do this again. We slow down. We shake a little more. We're a little more unsteady than we once were. And I know this is really, in a, in a way, it's kind of depressing. But the good news is we all going through it together. Every one of us are there or heading there quickly. And so at least there's, in the misery of, of it, there's some company anyway. And, uh, and, and so we can thank the Lord for that, I guess. So he talks about the keepers of the house shall tremble. Number two, he says the strong men shall bow themselves. Now, we've all heard the phrase, it's riding on your shoulders. You know, it's reference to how we got to carry the situation. It's on us. We've got to get under that load and bear that load. The shoulders are symbols of the strength of a person. The strong men shall bow themselves. He's talking about our shoulders, that as we age, these strong men, they begin to bow over 
or bow over and stoop over. I've heard people when asked, you know, I've heard some men when asked their height, how tall are you? They say, well, I used to be six foot, but now I'm about 5'10", because no longer straight and tall, but the weight of time, the weight of the burdens of life, have somewhat bowed our bodies, stooped us, our shoulders are more stooped than they once were. Our, our strong men bow themselves. They're not erect and, and strong like they were when we were young, but they're bent over. Number three, he says, and the grinders cease because they are few. Well, what's he talking about? Well, the mouth is the mill, and the teeth are the grinders. And old age brings more and more dental problems. Or, in some cases, less and less dental problems because we have less and less teeth to deal with. But this, this would have been more so in Solomon's day, obviously, than in our day. I mean, Solomon's day, they didn't have dentists. You know, I don't know what they did when they had teeth problems. I, I, I pastored a uh, church in Crossville. There's a boy in my, in my church that uh, worked at the uh, Hickory smoke plant in, uh, between Monterey and uh, Crossville. And they made charcoal and, and hickory sm liquid smoke and things. And uh, he was telling me one day, he said that he worked with a guy. He said they were at work. And said so this guy had a toothache, really bad toothache. And said he was groaning with it, complaining all night. And finally this boy, his name was Dale. Dale said, I'll pull it for you. And that guy said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I got some pliers in my toolbox. I'll pull it for you. And that crazy boy sat down in a chair and opened his mouth and let that boy, and he put the pliers on his teeth and pulled that tooth out. And he said, after that, I did all his dental work after that, he said. <laughs> but he, he literally, I said, Dale, you got to be kidding. He said, no, I pulled it out. I cannot imagine. I can't even fathom that. I cannot even get that in my brain. It's bad enough to be under Novocaine and gas and all that and have it done. But in Solomon's day, no, no dentist, no toothbrushes. You know, I read somewhere, uh, this, you know, the, people make these lists of the greatest things in history. And this list had the greatest inventions in history. I don't know who made the list, but their number one greatest invention in history, toothbrush. They said toothbrush has, has cured more medical problems and pain and so forth than anything ever invented. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but just the fact that somebody would name that is really kind of amazing to think about. A simple thing like a toothbrush, and it's probably been less than 100 years since they've been invented. No dentist, no toothbrush, no floss, no toothpaste. And usually it wasn't long until there were no teeth because they'd lose their teeth. As recently as even in the colonial days in America, most every man had wooden teeth. And I'm sorry, but it wasn't romantic like Wind Comes the Heart or even Gone with the Wind or other movies about the 17, 1800. The reality was, ladies, if you kissed your husband, he either had to take his teeth out or you got splinters in your lips. Now, splinters in the lips are never romantic, I'm just saying. And so Solomon is saying here that the day's going to come when the grinders are going to cease because they're few. So as you get old, more tooth problem, teeth falling out, things like that. So he's pointing to the youth, and he's telling them, look, as you get older, there's, your teeth, they're going to wear out, they're going to fall out, they're going to be pulled out. Remember that. Number four. And those that look out of the windows be darkened. Okay, so he's referring here to the dimming of the eyesight. The dimming of the eyesight. It's amazing the conversations that you have when you're past 50 years old that you would never, ever, ever have when you were 20 or 30 years old. We were in the men's prayer room, I think it's two Sunday nights ago. And somehow we got to talking about this thing of failing eyesight. I think we were actually talking about the, the Sunday school lesson from Ecclesiastes that morning. Anyway, we got in a conversation about the difficulty of seeing in, in your glasses when you're laying on your back and working on a car or a piece of equipment and looking up, and you got bifocals. So the, 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 the nearsighted part, the part you need to see up close, rather, is down at the bottom of your glasses. You're laying on your back, and you're looking up, and you can't see. And then you try to raise your head up, and you bang your head on something. You can't see. And so we were talking about that. Brother Jay, he come up with the solution. He said, all you got to do is turn your glasses upside down. 
wear your glasses upside down so that the clo parts closes up at the top when you're looking up. And we were all like, that's, that's amazing. But I, I thought to myself as we were saying, I said, this is a conversation that would only take place amongst a bunch of men 50 years or older. You would never hear somebody 20 years old or 30 years old talking about turning their glasses upside down on their face so they could see. I worked uh, for a man named George Knowles when I was a boy. I think he's one of the first people, if not the first person, that when I moved to Tennessee that I began working for. And when I was a boy, from the age I was 13 till I went in the Navy, I worked for George on his farm. He, had a, he was a farmer, and I mowed his yard at his house and tilled his garden and, and uh, whatever kind of work he needed. And then when I, when I came out of boot camp, the Navy, I, I was only there a few weeks, came out, um, I was looking for a job, and he called me, actually, and hired me at, uh, he owned a restaurant in, uh, in Sparta, Tennessee. And so I went to work in his restaurant. But anyway, he, I worked on his farm and, and did all his farm work. And uh, one, one day they were cutting and baling hay. I was, I was hauling hay for him. And uh, one of my good friends, who George knew very, very well, knew better than me, actually, he'd asked me if I said, do you think George needs any help? I said, oh, no, why don't you just come down there and find out? He said, well, I sure need some work. I said, well, he'd probably put you to work. So... Um, George, uh, so we were hauling hay, and uh, George had terrible eyesight. I mean, I don't know if it's cataracts or what, but uh, he could not see anything and would drive, drive everywhere, drive up to town, drive to work. And, and so this friend of mine, Darren was his name, Darren uh, came up in the hay field, walked up in the hay field, and asked George, said, hey, George, said, do you need any help? And George said, no, no, I don't think we do. I think we got everybody we need. And they talked a minute, and finally George said, well, who are you anyway? And he said, well, Darren Swindle. Oh, Darren, yeah, we need some help. We need some help. He didn't know who he was. I mean, standing closer than Brother Jay and I are standing, he couldn't see him to even know who he was. Well, the older you get, your eyes become a problem. I've heard it said that, um, that an eye doctor can predict within just a year or two your age by looking at, you know, the progression of you, the deterioration of your sight. They can determine that. So it's, a, it's kind of an etched-in-stone thing. Some may have to wait a little longer till they get reading glasses, but you hit that 40 to 45 mark, and you're going, to be, uh, you're going to be needing them. Those that look out the windows be darkened, the dimming of the eyesight. Even in the Scriptures, you know, it talks about, um, like the patriarchs, when they got old, their eyes dimmed. That's how they describe old age, their eyes dimmed. Okay? So that's what it's talking about. Uh, number five, uh, verse 4. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low. And so here's, here's two analogies that, that refer to the hearing difficulties that accompany getting older. The door, okay, the, he said the door shall be shut in the street. So the door represents interaction with the outside world. When the door shut, our, our interaction with the outside world of course, this is the days before internet. Our interaction with the outside world was, was limited. It speaks of the difficulty of interacting with others because of the onset of being hard of hearing, difficult to hear. And you know, if you've ever encountered, now I, I think my hearing's pretty good, I might be wrong, but I have had a lot of problem over the years with my ears getting stopped up. And when my ears get stopped up, I don't want to talk to anybody because I, I can't hear and, and, and you know, I, things that I think are over here are over here. And it's just so difficult. I can't imagine when, the he, when your hearing really starts to go, and, and especially people in the past, that there was nothing they could do about it. And, and speaking of that, again, I want to point out, I want to say this. There's a lot of depressing words in this poem. It's not exactly a, a lifter-upper poem. But I, want, I do want to say this. I know there's a lot of bad things going on in the day that we live in. You know, we hear all about the bad news and all the bad things, but I'm going to tell you there's a lot of good things going on in our, the day we live as well. Thank God for surgeries and hearing aids. Little old hearing aids, don't even know people's wearing them. They stick them in their ear. I remember when I was in school, we had a boy who was partially deaf, and he had to wear a box around his, a rope around his neck and a box about that big in order to be able to hear. And, uh, you know, of course, got ridiculed, made fun of, you know how that goes in school. But uh, now, the little hearing aid don't, can't hardly even know 
Somebody's got it in and put it in, and the gift of hearing is restored to some degree. we got a lot to be thankful for in the day we live in. We really do. And uh, what a blessing that that is. I, 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 will, I will never forget when Brother Lloyd Nelson finally got hearing aids or a hearing aid. And Brother Lloyd could not hear thunder, bless his heart. I, I don't mean that in any derogatory way. He just couldn't hear. And he would come to church, and he would tell me. I'd go visit him. He'd say, Preacher, I can't hear a word. I can't hear. He said, you know, people are going to have to speak up. I can't hear a word anybody's saying. And I remember when he got those hearing aids, and he came to church the first time after he got them. He was like a little boy that got a new puppy. I have never seen a man smile and so happy. And I remember he stood up. He sat about where Brother Don is, I think, or maybe the seat in front. He stood up and testified about how good it was to hear and his ability to hear. What a joy it was. So thank God for modern medical miracles that we enjoy. Amen. Thank the Lord for it. So Solomon continues this analogy about our hearing loss as we get older. The door is shut in the streets. And then he said, the sound of the grinding is low. Now, grinding of meal in that day was a very, very common sound. It would be like us saying that uh, the sound of automobiles was very low. I mean, everywhere you went, somebody had a meal. People had meals, a ground meal. And the idea here is that the person who is older and losing their hear hearing, even common sounds, things that they've heard all their life, experienced all their life, are no longer discernible to them. And it's a part of, of growing older, the hearing dims. Sounds that we used to hear every day, sounds maybe we enjoyed, sounds that we took for granted. You know, we heard them all the time, didn't think about them, and now that we can't hear them, we sure miss hearing the sound of that. No longer can hear them. And again, I say, praise the Lord, we live in a day when there's help, when there's glasses, cataract surgery, uh, 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 LASIK surgery, they even put new corneas on your eyes, and then you don't have to wear glasses anymore, hearing aids that are so small that they fit in your ear. Thank God, thank God, thank God for the miracles that God has blessed us to have in this day and time. Now, verse four, the next part of verse 4, everybody here, look around. Maybe Eli, he might be the exception to, to this. But um, everybody else is going to know exactly what Solomon's talking about, I think. Verse 4, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird... So here's one we can all relate to, sleeping problems. Miss Heather, you're exempt from this too. I'm sorry. I was trying to look around and see. But most of us understand exactly what this is about. The picture here is, as we get older, Brother Evan, see, I'm forgetting people. You're exempt from this. Everybody's exempt from this except me, okay? All you young people that are out there, you're exempt. It's just me. But the, the picture here is, we get older, we don't sleep as good. And if somebody would have told me that 10 years ago, said, you know, day's going to come, you're not going to be able to sleep, could I say? You're crazy. I, sleep, I can sleep anywhere, anytime, for any length of time. If something doesn't wake me up, I sleep right on. I slept in the floorboard of trucks, front seat of pickup trucks, bed of trucks, floors, out on the ground, in tents, you name it, I've slept. No problem. But I'm going to tell you something. It's going to change one of these days. It's going to change. Mark my words. And the picture here is that we wake up with the birds. At the sound of the bird, we, we wake up with the bird. But, and the worst part of that is sometimes we go to sleep with the coons. And then we wake up with the birds. And that's really for the birds when that happens. So it also means that the slightest things disturb our sleep. You know, I mean, we sleep, I used to sleep through anything. I mean, a hurricane come through. It wouldn't. I wouldn't wake up. Now the slightest little creak, slightest little noise, slightest little wind, awake. Now, you know, like I said, I used to sleep in a, uh, I've slept in the floorboard of a truck, front seat of truck, floor, ground. Now I can be in my comfortable bed with my electric blanket and my special pillow. I got my own special pillow. And uh, for years, it was uh, one of these little pieces of egg crate, I think they call them, you know what I'm talking about, like that sponge stuff. And it's real thin because of my neck. I got to have something really thin. And then I, it gets wadded up in a ball and goes under my arm and I lay on my side, sleep on my side. And, uh, and it 
I had it for years, and it finally just disintegrated, and it was just nothing but powder. And I still used it like that. And I took it with me. I went to preach somewhere or something, stayed in a hotel, and I left it in a hotel. I, I thought I was going to die. I mean, I'd slept on that for years. So then I got one of the, Tammy got me, finally I tried everything, couldn't find anything. She got one of these uh, bamboo pillows, and I had to rip it open and take about half of the stuffing out, which worked out pretty good because then I made two pillows. So I got one to take with me when I go and one when I'm here. So anyway, I got my electric blank, my special pillow, and, uh, and, and the perfect temperature in the house, and dead tired, and take sleeping pills, and still can't sleep good. So... When I, you know what I get out of this when I read this? It's obvious to me that Solomon wrote this book when he was older. Because he describes the results of getting older too vividly and too accurately to just be something that he's heard somebody talk about. He has experienced it and is experiencing it. He describes youth as a man who experienced it. He describes growing old as a man who's experiencing it. He said, uh, the, you're gonna, the voice, you're going to rise up at the voice of the bird. And then verse number four, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Here he speaks about um, how the fact that singing and appreciation for music wanes with age. Men and women who used to have booming, lively voices with age, those voices are brought low. Those, that, that voice that once shook the rafters when they sang, now their voice is the one that's shaking. Here's a, I think there's a key here, though. I think there's something that we can learn from this. And it's a key to keeping youthful in our heart. And a key to keep, one key to keeping youthful in our heart is to keep our love for music alive in our heart. Music is a gift from God, the right kind of music. And it stirs the emotions of the heart. And it's good for us to be stirred in the emotions of our heart and not get just, you know, old and crotchety and irritable. But it's good for us to keep music a big part of our lives, to sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs. It revs the juices of the soul. It rejuvenates a person's heart. We can't rejuvenate our body we can to some degree but you know we're never going to overcome old age but we can rejuvenate our heart we can be young at heart and to me one of the i guess i'm being petty when i say this but to me one of the great inventions of the last 20 years is is music services where i can go in and pick the songs that i want and put them on my phone or my computer and listen to exactly what i want to listen to I don't have to wade through 50 crummy songs to hear the one I want to hear or haul an eight-track player around with me and keep hitting the skip button to get, get through it. When, when, I go, when I go out and I run, I, I have just exactly the songs on my phone that I want to listen to, and I push the button, and bam, there they are. And, and just to spice things up a little bit because I'm a wild and crazy guy, I'll put it on shuffle, and they'll play in different orders. And that's really wild. But there they are. And I just got, uh, you know, I'm behind everything and I just got kind of tuned into this just in the last couple of years and it has brought back to my heart a love and appreciation for music that really in some ways I had lost some of that because the reason being I would get so disgusted listen to music on airwaves and I'm too impatient to fool with a CD and put a CD in and get that playing and skip and all that so and and, uh, I'm, and, and the music on the airway I'm talking about Christian music so much of it it's so shallow and so doctrinally wrong and just plain bad. And I get so irritated listening to gospel music on the radio. Now, I'm in control. I run the radio station. I'm, I'm like a megalomaniac. I got the power, and I'm drunk with that power. And I can listen to what I want to want, listen to, who I want to listen to, when I want to listen to them. I don't know about you. I think that's great. I like being in control. Amen. Actually, I'd rather God be in control, but when it comes to the music, I want, I want to be in control. So keep love for good music alive in your heart, and it will help keep you youthful at heart. When's the last time you walked around your house singing to the top of your lungs, just singing 
and sing it loud? Y'all try it sometime. Maybe wait till your spouse is gone. She, she or he might not want to hear you, but I come in from running. I'll be this song, got the earphones in, so I can't even hear myself, and, t- and, and everybody in the house will jump and run and hide, and uh, I'll be singing to the top of my lungs, but it's, it's good for the soul. It really is. Verse 5, and, and when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way. Okay, so uh, young folks, they seem to have no fear or very little fear. They climb anything, they go anywhere, they jump from any height, but the older you get, the more fear creeps in your life. Matter of fact, I, I read or heard one time that, that that part of the brain that can assess risk and fully contemplate danger does not fully develop until the age of 25. And uh, watching some of these 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, I believe that. I believe that. They have no fear. You know, they, I mean, we all did it. We was a kid, most of us, you know, drive a car recklessly, way above the speed limit. We get older, though, we slow down, you know, except for Brother Randall Landrum. He, he drives like a maniac. He does everything. He's not here, so I'm going to talk about him. He does, he does everything slow, Brother Randall. So, and he gets in that car, and then all that that's been bottled up, you know, <laughs> and all that slowness just, poosh, and he drives like a madman. But most of us, we get older, we drive slower. I remember when, when I was young, and Tammy and I would jump in our car, and we'd have four nearly bald tires, car not running right, no money to fix it, and we just jump in the car, take off, go to Georgia or wherever, South Carolina, Alabama, whatever. I remember we had a, one point we had a Ford LTD, a big old long car, it's about as long as this building is wide, and it had a four-cylinder motor in it. And, and I bought it that way on purpose, Brother Harold, because Tammy has a lead foot when it comes to driving. And so I thought, man, if I get this big old heavy car and that little four-cylinder motor, she can put her foot to the floor, and she's not going to go more than 30 or 40 miles an hour. So that's what I bought. Well, after we'd owned it a while, it started making this terrible noise, Brother Jay, in the front end. When you would turn the steering wheel, it would pop, 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 pop. And I didn't really have the money to get it fixed. Didn't have the time to take it anywhere. So I, I know this is dumb. I look back, and I'm like, I can't believe I did that. We just kept driving it. We drive it all over the country. I drive it all over wherever I was preaching, wherever I go. I remember I had uh, had a guy in a car with me. Matter of fact, brother D.C. Robin, man, used to pastor this church many years ago in the car with me, and uh, driving him somewhere. And I went around a curve. That thing went to popping. D.C. about jumped out of the car. He said, "What in the world is that?" I said, "I don't know. Been doing that a long time. Just kept right on going." And he never rode with me again after that. Well, one night we went to a revival or something in Monterey, or I was preaching in Monterey. It must have been like a midnight service or something because it was way in the wee hours of the morning. I was driving back home, and most normal folks, smart folks, were in bed already, asleep. And, and, and I went around a curve, and that was the last pop. I mean, it popped completely, and the whole front end fell out from under the car. We were in the middle of nowhere, no cell phones in that day. And so I walked up in this driveway and uh, knocked on a door, and these big, huge dogs come running after me. And finally, a man come to the door. He had a gun in his hand. And I told him, I told him who I was and what happened. And thankfully, he was related, just happened to be related to a man, a preacher that I knew. And, and so we, we got there on the same page. And he let me use his phone. And I had to get somebody to come get us, take us home, have the car towed. And listen, I, I, was, I was dumb enough to drive around something like that. But in all honesty... I was probably 21, 22 years old. I just didn't have any fear about it. I didn't worry about stuff like that. It's dumb to be that way. And I hope I've gotten a little smarter with older age. I know I've gained a little more fear in older age than I had when I was younger. I don't want to get stranded in the middle of nowhere in the dark anymore, if I can help it at all. And even with a cell phone, I still don't want to. Now I try to make sure that the car's in tip-top shape. All the tires have the right air pressure. Brakes are good. Everything's ready. No popping noises. Don't want no popping noises. But my problem back then was probably more dumbness than bravery. But it is true. As we get older, we we face fears that we didn't when we were younger. Things we used to have no fear about, now they, they kind of cause us to pause and consider them and think, well, maybe, maybe that's not the smartest thing to do. 
We can't do the things that we once did. We, we become a little more vulnerable than we were when we were 18 or 19 or 20 years old. And so we become a little more frightened about things. Verse 5, he continues, And the almond tree shall flourish. When the almond tree blossoms, it's white. So he's speaking here about the changing of the hair. It just happens. It seems like one day it's jet black. And then you wake up one day and you're like, where'd all those come from? And they're white. It happens over time. And that thick, dark head of hair will one day look like a blossoming tree, white all over. Number 10, verse 5 also, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. He's saying here that little things become a burden. Little things that used to didn't bother us, now they bother, bother you. Things you used to do with no problem, you used to accomplish with no problem, now they're difficult to do. Strength fails. Endurance is uh, not what it used to be. Patience falls short of where it used to be. And things that used to be little things, now they become a great burden to us. And the purpose of Solomon in this is, again, to encourage young people to do all that they can now. While they're young, serve the Lord fervently in youth because time limits the service that you can do. So serve him now. Remember now the creator in the days of that youth. Well, we'll pick up with this happy, cheerful section next week, okay? Father, thank you for... Uh, allowing us to look in your word. And Lord, help us to be strong in the Lord. And Lord, help us, Lord, uh, you know, as old age comes, there's blessings in it. And there's things to be thankful for in it. And there's still service to do for you in it, Lord. It's not all bad news, but Solomon does point out some of the changes that come in our life. But Lord, help us to be appreciative of the helps and the aids that we have, Lord, to help us, Father, that are uh, older years will be more comfortable and more profitable. We just thank you for all your blessings, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Hey, bless you, brother. No, I figured out what's wrong with you. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I told you. I don't tell you what's wrong with you. <clears throat> the only thing, wrong all of us. One thing, sleeping. I don't have a problem. Is that right? Once in a great, 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 great Well, that's time. great. Well, the only problem I do have is if I can't lay in bed and sweat. Mm -hmm. But other than that, uh, I, I can go to sleep pretty well. That's great. Praise the Lord for it. Yeah, yeah. Everything else, you know. Yeah. The ears, the eyes, the patience. Yes, sir. Bless you, brother. <laughs>
All right, time to go ahead and get started this morning. Good to be back in the house of the Lord for the worship service. And uh, we're very thankful to be here, thankful for you being here today. And we're looking forward to the service today, uh, this morning's service. And then tonight we've got a missionary going to be with us, Brother Ben Thompson, missionary to Myanmar. He'll be, he'll, he'll be here with us in the evening service, so remember him as he travels in. He'll be traveling in this afternoon. And uh, will be with us tonight, the Lord willing. And uh, next month, beginning of February, will be our youth month, okay? So we've been trying to uh, plan some, some things for the month. And uh, we're going to be announcing those in the days to come. But please keep that in mind. And speaking of that, I, I failed to ask Miss Michelle to put this in the bulletin. I just uh, slipped my mind till later. But I want to meet with the Sunday school teachers after church for just no more than three or four minutes, Okay. So I want to talk to you all about what the theme's going to be and some ideas about that. So if you just meet me just uh, up here at the front, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that. And it won't take just a few minutes, okay, after church, if you don't mind. Appreciate that. So remember that. We do want to pray for our young people as we enter into Youth Month and pray specifically for the uh, services. And we'll have uh, some visiting preachers here. And um, hopefully the Lord will really bless us with some great services, and we uh, look forward to it and excited about it. So remember that. Keep that in your prayers, okay? Well, we had several prayer requests in our adult uh, Bible class, and we'll go over that list tonight, several prayer needs. But for right now, we're going to stand together and go to the Lord in prayer and pray for our service this morning. We've got two preachers out of our church that are preaching. Uh, Brother Sam Loy is preaching down in Lenore City at Second Baptist Church. Remember Brother Sam and Miss Trish as they're gone, and as Brother Sam is preaching. And then Brother Randall's preaching at Meadowview Baptist Church for Brother Ralph um, Nance in Brother Nance's place. And he'll be preaching this morning and tonight, I think also preaching in nursing home service this afternoon. So remember these two men as they're away preaching as we pray, okay? All right, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to help us today. Brother Keith Burge, would you lead us in prayer, please, sir? Amen. All right, Brother Eli, you come lead us in some music, if you would, please, sir. Turn to page 44. 44. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. 
the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory. Great things He hath done. Shake hands of fellowship this morning.
choir thank you for the good singing this morning we appreciate that good song living by faith and uh, the other songs as well we do praise the lord for them i've never been sorry that i trusted his name i've been sorry of a lot of things that i've done and i've just been plain sorry sometimes but i've never been sorry that i trusted the lord's name i appreciate that good song thank you choir so much where's uh, mr gunner crash where are you at gunner can you stand up for us stand up we want to see you stand up. How's your knee doing? I am so glad that you're back. We missed you so much. Can you bend your leg now a little bit? Can you? Are you able to kick Daniel yet in the shin? You, you don't have to demonstrate. I just wanted to know the answer. So you're back and going, huh? That a boy. Yeah, he's all right. He's back to normal. Amen. That's so great. We are so glad Gunner's here and doing well. Looks, uh, he's shown everybody a scar. It looks like everything's healing good. And so we thank the Lord for that. That's great. Amen. All right. We're going to go ahead and receive the offering. If you don't give enough, we're going to send Gunner around to kick you. So please give and give his unto the Lord this morning. Okay. Amen. Brother Jay, would you ask a blessing, please, sir? Father, we're so thankful for the privilege you've given us to come into your house today, Lord. We're so thankful, Father, for the teaching of your word that we heard. We're thankful, Father, for each and every blessing of life that you've given it to us. And, Father, as we come to this part of the service, I pray that you'd add your blessing to this offering. And we give you the praise and thanks to you. Amen. Amen.
appreciate that. Uh, Brother Evan's going to come sing for us. Pray for Brother Evan as he comes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. It's great. Yeah. Yes. Amen, Miss Darlene. I do appreciate the, the the meeting, the messages. The Lord really blessed great messages. And, um, you know, I just I, I appreciate when uh, when I hear a preacher preach and I leave, I don't have to try to scratch my head and figure out what, what in the world he's talking about. And uh, it's, it's a blessing to me. Brother Brady just lays it out there in terms I can understand it and conceive what he's talking about or perceive what he's talking about. And I appreciate and thank the Lord for the messages this week. been tremendous. Or last week. Somebody else? All right, you pray for Brother Ed. Before we sing, I appreciate the Lord being good to me this morning. And um, my heart's a little overflowing this morning because I think back to 14 years ago today that the Lord saved me. And um, I appreciate God's goodness. I remember everything about that night when the Lord made himself real to me. I remember the preacher as he stood and preached on hell and how real that God made that to me that night. And boy, I sure am glad God's goodness to me. And I appreciate a faithful God this morning. I'm glad that he hadn't been as faithful to me as I've been to him. He's been more faithful. If If I can get you to understand that. I'm glad he's not as faithful to me as I have been to him. Because if he had been as faithful to me as I've been to him, I'd be in big trouble this morning. But I appreciate the good, faithful God that we serve this morning. He's been better to me than I deserve, and I appreciate him being good to me. In my moments of fear, through every pain, every tear, there's a God who's been faithful to me. Reaching out for what pleased me, still my God, He was faithful to me. And every word He promised is true. And what I thought was impossible, I've seen my God do. He's been faithful, faithful to me. Looking back, His love and mercy I see. Though in my heart I have questioned, even failed to believe, yet He's been faithful, faithful to me. If you're old 
by this world in all its beauty. Many stately mansions daily you may see, but without great wealth I know I will never own one, and you will neither if you're no more rich than me. Oh, but if your soul can look beyond what man is building, and you can see what earthly mortals cannot see, for on the other side of Jordan there's destruction. For a mansion being built just for you and me, just the way till you've seen my brand new home. Wait till you see its beauty rare. Nothing down here can compare. Just the way till you see my brand new home. My heavenly Father's building me, and I'm gonna occupy for free. Just the way till you see my brand new home. Now this home, it will not set upon foundations that are man-made and will someday pass away. It won't be built where the storms of life can batter. Where the storm clouds often hide the light of day, oh, but the cornerstone, God is my foundation. The root of David, Christ the Lord, my coming King. What a welcome and homecoming there awaits me, and I'm expecting any day just to move right in, just the way till you see my brand new home. Wait till you see its beauty rare. Nothing down here can compare. Just the way till you see my brand new home. My heavenly Father's building me, and I'm going to occupy for free. Just the way till you see my brand new home. Appreciate that, Brother John. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Amen. Anybody else? I thank God for how good he is. Um, yes, sir. Of course, Becky and Kylie have been sick. Becky had a good doctor. hospital to do three or four different tests, you know, and they were, they were real concerned about pneumonia or walking pneumonia, and, uh, and it's nothing I've done, it's all the Lord, I prayed right then when Becky told me, and said, God, just, just let it be just bronchitis, you know, and they said, if it ain't those things, it's bronchitis, and, and I don't know, it was a couple hours later, Becky called me back with those test results, and they said, everything's fine. It's just bronchitis. I mean, it's no fun, of course, but, well, but we're just so thankful that, that it wasn't worse than it is. I mean, she's still not feeling good and everything, but, but I'm just thankful. Amen. For just that small little prayer. Amen, and, brother. And he, he wants us to come to him with, with
of small things and, and big things sure. and everything. And I don't remember who was preaching when this thought hit me, but, but really everything is little to God when it comes yeah. to us. Everything's small to Him. Not that, not that He doesn't care, but it's, it's easy stuff for Him. Sure. I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah. I'm just thankful that He cares and that He does this. Amen, Amen, Brother Jonathan. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. Just remind me if I'm sick, I don't want you praying for me, brother. I don't, I don't want bronchitis. <laughs> Amen. I'm just, I'm teasing. I do thank the Lord for that, brother. Praise the Lord. Somebody else? All right, we're, we're going to read, uh, we're going to read from Revelation chapter 1. If you turn your Bible, back in Revelation chapter 1 this morning. Revelation chapter number 1, and uh, we'll begin reading verse number 8, and uh, read down probably to verse, through verse 11, okay? Verse 8 to verse 11, Revelation chapter 1, appreciate everybody who's here today. I don't think we have any visitors, but if we do, we welcome you this morning, and uh, we are certainly glad to be here. Miss Desiree's here, but we don't count you a visitor, amen, so we're glad everybody's here today, right? Revelation 1 verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Father, thank you today for the word of the Lord. And we do thank you for the singing, and uh, the choir, and the congregation, and the special singing, the testimonies that have been given, that have lifted our hearts towards you. I pray, Father, now as we look in the word of the Lord, that we might come to know you in an either, even greater way, Lord, than we did when we got here today. Lord, I pray that we could learn of you. And Lord, as we learn of you, our faith will be strengthened, our lives will be edified, and Lord, we'll become stronger in our walk in this life. So I do pray you help us to learn of you. And Lord, we uh, thank you for all that you're, you've done and you're doing. And, Lord, there are many prayer requests among our church family, a lot of unspoken requests, Lord, that folks don't even know what they are, battles, that, uh, trials that people are enduring. And yet, Lord, you know what they are. You're with them. You will never forsake them. And we thank you for the promises we have in your word. Help us now as we look in this passage, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're looking at this final time that the Lord Jesus shows up in John's writings, and he appears here in Revelation 1. He shows up to John on Patmos as, uh, uh, as Jesus the Magistrate. And so we've been examining some things here in his appearance to John um, and how, he re how he's revealed to him. And, and the first thing that we're looking into is um, the portrait of the Magistrate. John unexpectedly sees the Lord on Patmos. He witnesses this remarkable appearance of the Lord, and then John paints a, a verbal picture for us of what he saw that morning on the island. It's one of the more vivid descriptions. Matter of fact, I would venture to say it is the most vivid description that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, perhaps the only physical description that we have of the Lord outside of his sufferings and the passion, uh, during his passion and so forth. And J John's description of Jesus is meant to help us comprehend something of the Lord's might and majesty and power. To see the Lord Jesus in His majesty was obviously an overwhelming experience for the Apostle John. For when he saw Him in His glory and His majesty, John fell at His feet as a dead man. So we looked here the last time. We, be we began looking at three aspects of this portrait of Jesus. We first looked at the articulation. Okay, that is what he sounded like. And the Bible describes the voice of the Lord. Verse 10, John said he heard a great voice as of a trumpet. Verse 15, he says he heard a voice as the sound of many waters. Now today we're going to look at a second aspect of this portrait of Christ. 
and that is the affirmation, okay? So the articulation is what he sounded like. The affirmation is what he said. And John describes not only how Jesus sounded when he spoke, but what Jesus said when he spoke. And so the Lord speaks affirmation of who he is to John the Apostle. And he wanted to be sure that there was no mistaking who it was that John was seeing. And he also wanted to be clear of the position that Jesus occupies. So he spoke these words to fulfill those two desires. To make no mistake who John was seeing and the position that Jesus now occupies. Now, there are four things that we're going to look at here that the Lord affirms in his words to John. Number one, he affirms a description of himself, okay? And, and I, I think this affirmation in particular is great. And the reason I think it's so great is because the deniers of the Lord Jesus Christ are really going to have a difficult time denying what Jesus said that day to John on the Isle of Patmos. Now here's what I mean. We have groups of people who like to meet for religious purposes. They love the idea of going to church. They love the idea of meeting together. They love the idea of being religious. But they're just not buying, if I could use it, say it that way, buying this thing of Jesus dying and raising from the dead. To them, that's just not true. That's a myth. It's, it's a distortion. It's, it's overzealous followers of Jesus down through the history who have created this narrative that Jesus died and resurrected. Now, they believe that Jesus was a good man, a great teacher, a true moral leader, but he did not raise from the dead. Maybe he swooned, passed out, and then the cool environment where they laid him, revived him, uh, or maybe he resurrected spiritually. Some believe they have all kinds of explanation, but Jesus was a good moral leader. Well, if he's a good man and a great teacher and a true moral leader, should we not listen to his words? Should we not hear what he has to say and, and believe that what he says is truth? Well, look what he says in verse 18 about himself. He said, I'm he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So either Jesus is not a good moral leader, or he died, he was buried, and he rose again. You can't have it both ways. If he's a good moral leader, then he is the Son of God because he declared himself to be the Son of God and he resurrected from the dead. And then we have those who say along the same line that Jesus never professed to be God. He's not God. That's just some hyperbole by overzealous followers who have made Jesus out to be something he never claimed to be. Well, let's see how Jesus describes himself here in Revelation 1. Verse number 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Verse 11, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Verse 17, I am the first and the last. Well, sounds pretty much to me like Jesus is claiming to be God. And of course, we have other instances of this as well. But it's amazing to me that in the Lord's final appearance in the Word of God, He reaffirms two aspects of His person that have been controversial points of unbelievers all down through history. His resurrection and His deity. Most folks are willing to believe that Jesus lived, that He existed. I mean, you cannot even deny that. You cannot be honest and deny that Jesus existed. Most folks will believe that. Most folks will acknowledge He was a good man. Most folks will acknowledge that He did good works. But the sticking point to many people is the deity of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here, he reaffirms them in his last appearance in the Word of God. It's as if he knew that it would be that way, that his deity would be denied, that his resurrection would be mocked, and so in sort of a preemptive strike, the Lord's final words to one of his disciples affirms once again, just in case anybody down through history might be tempted to say that Jesus never professed to be God or never raised from the dead, he most definitely affirms his deity and his resurrection. So now let's look specifically at what the Lord says in his description of himself here. The first words that Jesus speaks to John we find in verse 11. He said, uh, verse 11, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, or excuse me, I am Alpha and Omega, the first 
and the last. So the Lord Jesus begins his conversation with John by describing who he is. Now, notice here how he does that. He begins with the words, I am. I am Alpha and Omega. That's not, um, uh, that's not without purpose. He uses the title, I am. It is a verb indicating being and not becoming. It is a very familiar phrase and title in the Bible. In John chapter number 8, for example, the Jews were f furious that the Lord Jesus had said that if anyone would keep his sayings, that they should never die. They got all bent out of shape about that. So they pointed to their greatest hero, Abraham. They said, Abraham's dead. Are you saying to us that you're greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? You're saying if anybody keeps your sayings, they won't die. Abraham's the greatest of all of us. He's dead. The Lord Jesus responded to them by saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Boy, I'm telling you, that really got them going in. I mean, they said, look, you're not even 50 years old. And, and, and you have seen Abraham? But it was this next statement that Jesus made that really stoked their fires. Jesus responded to that statement by saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, that's not a mistake, an English mistake. That is a description. He did not say, before Abraham was, I was. He said, before Abraham was, I am. It is an emphatic statement. It meant that there was never a time when Jesus wasn't. It meant that Jesus never came into existence, but that he always was. The phrase also ties to the name, the name of God, Jehovah, which means the self-existing one. It means that God never, nobody ever brought God into existence. Nobody, God was not born. God was not created. He is the self-existing one. He doesn't need anything or anybody. Now, we human beings, sometimes we get to thinking that we're really hot stuff. I mean, we get to thinking we're so important, and, and we're so big, and we're so necessary, and, and, and the world just couldn't get by without us. But the fact of the matter is, we are totally helpless on our own. Amen. We couldn't even live if God didn't give us breath to breathe. We, could, we wouldn't have food if God didn't give us sunshine and rain and soil. We couldn't last one minute if God took away the resources of this planet that permit us to exist. We wouldn't last a minute. Not only do we need God, but we need other people as well. So we're not as big as we think we are. We probably wouldn't survive very long if, uh, if there was nobody else but us on this planet. And we certainly wouldn't be very important if there was nobody else on this planet. If there was no one else but us on this planet, just think how unimportant we would be. I mean, we might win a unanimous election, but what good would it do us if we were the only ones on the planet? Being all alone, we could do whatever we wanted to do. Nobody to stop us, no rules, no laws. But what fun would that be? So we need God, and we need other people. But God needs nothing. He is the self-existing one that needs nothing or no one else. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega. He is making a bold affirmation that he is not a mortal man, but he is indeed God, God in the flesh. He has always existed. He's always been in the present tense. He has always been in the Jews. When he made that statement in John 8, they knew exactly what he was saying and they sought to stone him, for he made himself equal with God. He was expressing the fact that he was indeed God. Amen. Now, Jesus shows up on Patmos, and he begins the description of himself with this phrase, I am. It is no coincidence. It is Jesus once again making an emphatic statement that he is indeed God, the self-existing one, the eternal God of glory. But notice he continues. He said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So as the Lord Jesus introduces himself to John here, just to make sure there is no mistaking whom Jesus is claiming to be, 
he, he, be, he refers here to the great attributes of God in his introduction to himself. First of all, he refers to his omniscience. Okay? Now, that's a big word. It's a theological term. It's, it's really a compound word in a sense. Omni meaning all. Science meaning knowledge. Meaning that God has all knowledge. He is all knowing. That's what it means. There is nothing, nor can there be anything, that God does not know. God knows everything. So here, notice how Jesus describes himself. He says, I am Alpha and Omega. Now that phrase is peculiar to the book of Revelation. It's found four times in the book of Revelation. You won't find it anywhere else in the Bible. And all four times, it is in reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you already know this. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. So he, he is saying here uh, that he's the Alpha and Omega, and he is implying by that he's the first letter, he's the last letter, and he's all the letters in between. Okay? He's Alpha and Omega. Then he says, I'm the first and the last. So we got an alphabetical reference. Now we've got a numerical reference. I'm the first and the last. I'm number one, and whatever number is the last number, I don't know what that is, but whatever number is the last number, I'm that too. And again, inferring that he is every number in between. Now, I don't, I, I don't have time to go down a rabbit hole here, but I, I want to I I think about this for a moment, what Jesus is saying. He is the first letter of the alphabet. He's the last letter of the alphabet. Inferring he's every letter of the alphabet. He's the first number. He's the last number. Again, inferring that he's every number in between. All the sum of human wisdom and knowledge is encapsulated in two entities. Letters and numbers. Okay? Any expression that we make about knowledge... Any record that we have of wisdom or knowledge, anything that we learn, we record that so others can learn from that. It is recorded in letters and numbers. All of history, all of engineering, all of literature, all of science, all of the truth that's contained in the Bible, all of the combined sum of knowledge and understanding and contemplation, all of that is expressed and recorded and preserved in letters and numbers. Then here steps the Lord Jesus on the stage, okay, and declares, I am all the letters and all the numbers. I am omniscient, all-knowing, God of glory. There is nothing that does not fall under my umbrella or my capacity to know. I know all things. There's nothing that God doesn't know. Job asked the question in Job chapter 21 and verse 22, Shall any teach God knowledge? Shall any teach God anything? Is there anything that God does not know? Is the question that Job answers. Do we harbor a hurt, a pain so deep, that God does not know the pain that we bear? Do we have a problem that is so complicated that God does not understand that problem that we're enduring? Can we get ourselves in a situation that is so difficult that the Lord does not know the answer to that situation? The Lord Himself asked this question of Abraham in Genesis chapter number 18. He said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And the reason that the Lord asked Abraham that question, God had promised Abraham and Sarah a child. They were childless. They were unable to have children. And God said, I'm going to give you a child. And that child is going to be the heir to all the promises that I've made to you, Abraham. Well, time went on and, and no child. So finally, Abraham and Sarah devised this plan to help God out a little bit. And the result of that was the birth of Ishmael to Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar. And, uh, and, and that resulted in a, in, a, in a failure. And still, no heir, no child of Abraham and Sarah. Now, Abraham's 99 years old. And Sarah is 90 years old. 
And now the Lord appears to Abraham and tells him that Sarah is going to bear a child. 99 years old, 90 years old. You know how Sarah reacted to that? She laughed. She thought that was hilarious. Look, look at me. Look at Abraham. He's 99 years old. I'm 90 years old. How in the world are we going to have a children? And she began to laugh. And then the Lord responded to Abraham and said, Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Now, medical science has been trying for probably forever to roll back the clock on the human body. And to their credit, we have to give them credit. They have made great advances. Uh, the lifespan of humans is longer than it's ever been, at least in our lifetime. And the well-being of human life is better than it's ever been in a lot of ways. But no scientist can, nor will they ever be able to do what God did for Abraham and Sarah that day when God said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? I believe this. I believe that God literally rolled back the clock on Abraham and Sarah. I mean, not only did she miraculously conceive a child, but God rolled back the time clock of her body, and she became younger than what her age indicated so that she was able then to biologically conceive a child. Now, some of y'all looking at me like very skeptical, like maybe I've lost my mind. But let me, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can't put your mind at ease today. In Genesis chapter 20, after God visited Abraham and Sarah and said, said that you're going to conceive a child, Abraham has another lapse in faith. And he takes Sarah and he leaves the land that God put him in, and he goes down to the land of Gerar, or Gerar, however you pronounce it. And while he's there, okay, him and Sarah are there, King Gerar, or the king of Gerar, rather, got his eye on Sarah and inquired of her. And Abraham, as he had done earlier in his life when they went to Egypt, he... He instructed Sarah to lie to the king. He said, now look, he's interested in you. He's, he's got his eye on you. And said, if we tell him that I'm your husband, then he's going to probably kill me and take you for his wife. So he said, here's what we're going to do, Sarah. said, when he comes inquiring, you tell him that I'm your brother. So that's what Sarah did. And the king took Sarah, thinking that she was on the market, so to speak. Excuse my crudeness there. But that she was on the market and took Sarah for himself. Now, i got a question for you. What kind of king looks at a 90-year-old woman? No offense to any who might be 90. But, I mean, you you got to confess. What kind of king looks at a 90-year-old woman and says, Right there's a hot tamale. That's probably not very nice to say, is it, Brother Jay? I'm sorry. <laughs> what kind of king does that? Sarah could not have looked like she was 90 years old. Are you embarrassed? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I'm a little embarrassed too. <laughs> But we done got in this deep, we might as well go the rest of the way in. I mean, she was 90 years old, but I'm trying to tell you, she didn't look 90 years old. What'd you say? Are you nine years old, Cole? Well, what does that got to do with anything, Gunner? This is going downhill fast, Brother Jay. We better get on our horse and get going. Now I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> she did not, I know what I'm talking about. She did not look 90. God rolled back the biological clock on Sarah. She found the fountain of youth. God rolled back the clock. She was young and beautiful like she had once been. And so God said to Abraham, is there anything too hard for God? Who can do that? Who can roll back the clock? Somebody who's 90 years old and make them look young and beautiful again. Who can do that? Nobody but God. 
Somebody might say, that's impossible. It cannot happen. But I say, is there anything too hard for God? Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He is above the accumulated knowledge of human wisdom and ability. There are textbooks that have not been written yet. There are truths that have not been postulated and recorded in a book at at this time yet. There are discoveries that haven't been made and incorporated in a book. There are distances to planet, numbers of cells in an organism, numbers of creatures in the ocean, none of which have been counted, but none of these will come as a surprise to God. Just as letters and numbers form the source of all human wisdom, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the source of all knowledge And all wisdom. The Lord Jesus made a couple interesting statements here concerning the vast knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ of God. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, Jesus said this. He said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Here, in order to teach us how much intimate detail the Lord pays to our life. He directs us to the death of a sparrow. He says two sparrows are worth, in human terms, a farthing. That's about a half of a penny in our modern day monetary system. So we would put the worth of one sparrow at a a quarter of a penny. They're basically of no value. And yet if just one sparrow falls to the ground, our Heavenly Father knows about it and is there. Jesus said shall not fall on the ground without your Father. He is there. He continued in Matthew chapter, uh, or the next verse, verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. I've talked about that at numerous times. You're all very familiar with this. The, the count of hairs on her head varies at any given moment. Old hairs are falling out. New hairs are growing in. They happen at different rates at different times of the year. Environmental factors affect that. Health affects that. Genetics affect that. The seasons of the year affect that. And yet the Lord assures us that the Lord, that the Father knows the hairs on our head. Isn't that something? I mean, we study to know about God. That's what we're doing this morning. We study to know about God, but... What amazes me is that God studies to know about us. Now, he doesn't have to study because he's God, but but in our terms, in our thinking, God studies us. He wants to know about us. He doesn't have to work as hard at it as we do, but he is interested, as Brother Jonathan testified, in the most, what seem to be insignificant, mundane manners of life. The number of hairs on her head. A sparrow falling to the ground. And the father is interested and he knows about it. Never mind the things that burden us, that bring us to tears, that break our hearts, that weigh on our minds. Never mind the prayers that we pray when we cast ourselves at the feet of Jesus and call on the name of the Lord Jesus for a burden that we're carried. The Lord hears and the Lord knows and the Lord is able to move on behalf of that prayer that we pray. That is the God that we serve who knows all about us and knows what we're going through and knows what what we're facing and knows our heart is breaking. Notice Jesus' conclusion concerning the Lord's knowledge and care for us in Matthew uh, 10. Verse 31, he says, Fear ye not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. So his conclusion, when we, when we understand it, a sparrow doesn't fall to the ground, but what the Father doesn't know and is there. And God knows the number of hairs on her head. Here's, here's Jesus' conclusion. Fear not. He says you don't have to fear. You don't have to panic. You don't have to fall apart. Because God knows. And God cares. And God is able. He is the encapsulation of all knowledge and wisdom. There's nothing that you're going through. There's nothing that you're enduring. There's no place that you're going to go or anything that you're going to encounter in this life, but God doesn't already know it. And God isn't already there. And God isn't going to take care of you. Fear ye not therefore. 
The Lord informs us here of the great knowledge of God and the great interest of God in us in order to relieve the fears that we harbor in our heart about things we know we can't do anything about. That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus tells us, so when we encounter circumstances in our life that are beyond our control, such as hair falling out, sparrows falling to the ground, we can rest in the Lord, cast our burden upon Him, knowing that He knows all about it. That He knows the situation even better than we know it. He knows it. And just like He's there when a sparrow falls to the ground, He is there wherever your burden may be. He is on the scene. You know, we, we, we talk a lot of times in, in our human terms. And we're going to call God, get God on the scene. I, call, I called upon the Lord and boy, He was there, He came, but He's already there. He knew it was going to happen before it ever happened. He was already there with you. And he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. He's there. And He helps us carry our burden. And He hears us when we pray. And He's already working in answer to our prayers. Now, we, we're kind of like Martha and Mary. We want Him there yesterday. Sometimes He delays four days. Or He's there four days late in our estimation. But God knows what He's doing. And we have got to rest our souls in the knowledge that God is all-knowing. And God can do all things. Now, back to our text here. John has been placed by the Roman magistrate, desolation on this island as punishment. He's all alone and banished. And yet he's not all alone. The Lord is with him. And as Jesus introduces himself to John, he does so with a reminder to John and to all who would read these words. As a matter of fact, the Bible, this is the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing to the people who read it. And so one of the blessings is this, that Jesus gives a reminder to John and to all of us who read these things that I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He's saying this, John, I know all the future times upon this earth. I know all about the rapture, the tribulation, the antichrist, the millennial reign. I'm going to tell you all about that. You're going to write about that. But I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to also, though, I want you to know that I know that your heart is heavy too, John. And I know what you're going through. And I know the loneliness that you're experiencing and the trial you're battling. And I'm here. I'm Alpha and Omega. Now let me close with this this morning. A wonderful lady named Annie Johnson Flint. She was born in 1866 in a little town not far from where I was born. Vineland, New Jersey. To Eldon and Jean Johnson little over two years, while she was not hardly three years old, her dear mother died after giving birth to Annie's younger sister. After some time of being in a kind of like an orphan home, Annie was finally adopted and her sister by Mr. and Mrs. Flint, a wonderful Christian couple who had raised Annie uh, to know the Lord, and she was saved at a young age. However, after Annie's high school graduation, her adopted parents, whom she loved very much, they both died just months apart. After Miss Flint's adopted parents died, Annie contracted severe rheumatoid arthritis. And it crippled and twisted her body to the point that she was unable to walk or to care for herself for the rest of her life. She then contracted and suffered from cancer, which resulted in her suffering excruciating pain and sores all over her body. And the author of her biography said that Annie was in such pain and had such sores on her body that she had to have eight pillows in certain places to prop her body and position her in such a way that she could limit the pain and endure it. And Annie had no way to care for herself. She couldn't work a job. And uh, her parents were dead. There was no money to provide for her needs. And there was no welfare system back then to aid her. And so Annie, who loved poetry anyway, began to write poems. And she wrote poems for the Lord and magazines and different uh, other avenues would come along for her to sell those poems. And her hands were so twisted and mangled that she, she could hardly hold a pen in her hand to write, but she would write poem after poem after poem. And she became one of the greatest hymn writers of all time. Her most famous hymn written in the midst of all this great suffering 
is a song that we still sing today. It says, He giveth more grace when the burdens go greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added afflictions, He addeth His mercy. To multiplied trials, He multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love knows no limits. His grace has no measure. His power nor boundary known unto man. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. As beautiful a lyric as that precious song is, it may not be her most touching lyric. I think this may be. Listen to the words of this. I know not, but God knows. O oh, blessed rest from fear, all my unfolding days to Him are plain and clear. Each anxious, puzzled why from doubt or dread that grows finds answer in this thought. I know not, but He knows. I cannot, but God can. O oh, balm for all my care. The burden that I drop, His hand will lift and bear. Though eagles' pinions tire, and I walk where I once ran, this is my strength to know. I cannot, but God can. When you can't, when you've gone as far as you can go, when you can't bear it anymore, no, God can. God can. In the midst of such overwhelming despair, Annie Johnson Flint took comfort in knowing that the Lord knows, that the Lord cares, that the Lord is with us, and that God can do what we cannot do. It's the same message that Jesus gave to John on Patmos when he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is so great that he holds all the world in his hand. And yet so great at the same time that while he holds the world in his hand, he can hold us in his hand and concern himself with what we're concerned with. 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all you care upon him, for he cared for you. Let's stand this morning. Brother Eli, you come if you would. Our musicians are coming with a verse of invitation. <laughs> This is my strength to know I cannot, but God can. Father, thank you, Lord, that you can. There's nothing too hard for you. We cannot even begin to understand your greatness. But Father, help us to trust you in the trying and difficult times of life. I pray, casting our burden upon you because you care for us. Help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know what your burden may be. I don't know what the care may be that you're carrying. Perhaps the Lord's speaking to your heart today. Will you come? Will you come talk to the Lord this morning as we sing?
Amen. You're here today, you don't know the Lord. Is the Lord dealing in your heart today? Will you come this morning? Will you come to Christ? Amen. All right, thank you, Brother Eli, Miss Tammy, Miss Barbara, thank you. God bless you for being here today. Please remember to be in prayer for the service this evening. Uh, Brother Thompson will be with us, missionary to Myanmar. Pray for him and his family as they drive in. Pray for our service tonight. Prayer rooms at 15 till, and then our service at 6 o'clock, okay? All right, God bless you for being here. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer at this time. Uh, Brother Braden, would you do that for us, brother?